Everybody can hear me, I hope. Everybody can see me. Uh, if you can't, then please let me know. Uh, I want to thank Simon for this great, great invitation. It is a pleasure to speak for all of you. It is a pleasure to speak for Eshkolot again. I had the great pleasure and privilege to speak for Eshkolot when the uh, festival met in Berlin about a year ago at this time. It was one of the most um, rewarding experiences of my academic career, uh, by which I mean specifically to be in uh, an audience of engaged readers who had an interest in Yiddish culture, who had an interest in the uh, Jewish culture of Berlin, past and present, and most remarkably and unusually for me, had an interest in what I had to say. So I'm very, very grateful to have had that experience. And I am very excited, enthusiastic to replicate that experience in the odd circumstances that we find ourselves uh, uh, today. As Simon mentioned, the original plan was for us to do this on site in Belarus, in Minsk, and in other important cities for modern Jewish history uh, this past summer. Circumstances prevented that from uh, uh, taking place. To my disappointment, and yet in spite of my disappointment at not being able to travel to Minsk for two equally compelling, urgent, and drastic reasons. Uh, nonetheless, I have to acknowledge that uh, in spite of the hardship of the world that we currently inhabit, there are some very nice uh, possibilities that have been created uh, uh, despite these um, terrible, terrible times. Um, and specifically what I mean is the opportunity to address people around the world uh, to rethink what an academic lecture, what an academic uh, uh, audience, what uh, 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 an undertaking can be, is really one of the more creative and resourceful responses to what is otherwise uh, a very terrible, terrible circumstance. I'm looking at some of the names that appear on my screen. I see uh, a few very, very good friends, and I'm so thankful that they are uh, joining me for this undertaking. I hope all of you will return in subsequent sessions. And I also see a lot of names that I hope by the end of the series will also have become my friends. Uh, so I really do hope that this will be uh, an experience for dialogue, for conversation, and for learning for all of us. Let me address the question of dire circumstances before we begin with the specific topic to which we are going to be dedicated in these four lectures. Um, circumstances in uh, Belarus right now are not very hopeful. Um, but hopefully that gives us opportunity to imagine a better future. Here's what I wanna say about that. And what I wanna say about the importance of the work that I hope to undertake with all of you over the next four sessions. When we read Yiddish literature, at any point in the history that it was produced, at any point in history when we uh, uh, encounter it, we are reading from a culture of political disenfranchisement. The Yiddish culture that was created uh, 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 through literature was the cultural production of a people without access to political representation, to political power. One of the lessons that that teaches us, and it's also a lesson that we can uh, derive from reading uh, the literatures of colonized people, uh, people of color, uh, people who have experienced uh, minority and marginalization in a variety of forms. When you lack direct access to political power, cultural production becomes a means of political representation. What we are doing now in reading Yiddish literature, we are reading a political literature. This is the means by which Yiddish speaking Jews empowered themselves. And hopefully this provides us 
with an inspiration, with a cultural model to pursue our own politics by other means, our own cultural politics. That being said, and it is a lesson that I have to repeat a lot over the last few years in uh, addressing audiences that are uh, reacting to their own political circumstances. We offer these lectures in solidarity with the Belarusian people. Let me talk a little bit now, first of all, about how the next four sessions will go, what I hope to uh, uh, contribute and to um, motivate and to direct today, and also uh, the historical and cultural circumstances out of which the work of literature that we're going to be discussing emerges. For the next four sessions, we are primarily going to be talking about a uh, short yet epic poem written in Yiddish by Moshe Kolbach, Reisen. Reisen is an old Yiddish term referring to Belarus. This is Moshe Kolbach's effort at imagining a Belarusian national epic in the Yiddish language. Let's pause for a second. Let's marinate on what that could possibly mean, what that says about Belarusian nationhood, what that says about the role of Jewish people in a Belarusia, in a Belarusian nation that had yet to exist at the time that Kulbach himself was writing. And what that says about the role of the Yiddish language in connection with the Belarusian language, with a larger national culture that was emerging. Let me start with the subject matter that I don't know so much about, but I hope that I know enough about it to make it compelling for us to contemplate as we consider this poem over the course of the day today and over the subsequent three sessions. And for today, let me say, I am hoping that today will be the day that I speak most in kind of a monologue in a lecture. Uh, and I say that not because I'm so eager and greedy to speak so much today, but rather because uh, I'm hoping that as the series progresses, our sessions will become more interactive and what will begin as a lecture will transform itself through your collaboration with me into a conversation. It is via conversation that all of us, myself very much included, learn the most. Not by one guy running his mouth uh, 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 without cease. I promise you there will be a ceasing to the extent that I run my mouth. We will not be here online on Zoom from now until next Wednesday. That much I can guarantee you. Let me start by saying a little bit about Belarusian nationalism and then turn to the geographical and cultural specificity of Belarus, of Reisen in Yiddish culture more broadly uh, uh, understood. From there, I wanna talk a little bit about the hero of our series, Moshe Kolbach, who is certainly one of my favorite Yiddish writers, one of my favorite writers. Belarusian nationalism. As you all know, it's a thing. It's really important. At the time that uh, Bielor, at the time that Kulbach was writing this poem in the early 1920s, about which a little bit more a little bit later today, uh, Belarus was already incorporated into the Soviet Union. Um, the way that Belarusian nationalism had defined itself in the 19th and early 20th century is distinctive from the nationalist movements that surround it, specifically Polish nationalism and an autonomous, what we can describe ultimately as a non-Czarist, non-imperial Russian nationalism. What's significant about Polish nationalism and Russian nationalism, as I understand it, is the interconnectivity of 
national aspiration and religious affiliation. One of the lessons of Polish nationalism, a subject that I know a little bit more about than Belarusian nationalism, is that the efforts to imagine a Polish nationalism in the 19th century independent of Polish Catholicism really never took flight. It doesn't quite exist. And the subject of how Jews fit into Polish nationalism, a very important subject for Jewish culture, a very important subject for Polish culture, but not a subject that lends itself to easy resolutions. Russian nationalism, as we say in Yiddish, all achas kama vakama. How much more so is any form of Russian nationalism inextricable from the relationship of Russian nationalism to the Paraswavna church, the Eastern Orthodox religion. And as probably, hopefully, many of us know, for the most part in the modern era, from the late 18th century to the 1917 to the February Revolution, Jews as such were not admitted into the historical lands of Russia without explicit and very hard to obtain uh, 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 governmental uh, permission. So there is no place for Jews in Russian nationalism as it was understood in the 19th century. There was an uncomfortable and an unresolved place for Jews in Polish nationalism. Belarus is essentially the only national liberation movement in Eastern Europe at that time that articulates itself independent of a specific religious affiliation which means that the prospects for Jews to integrate into a, a hypothetical Belarusian national identity are much greater, in fact, than they would be in Russian nationalism or Polish nationalism as it had been understood in the 19th century, in the heyday of European nation state formation and national liberation movements. This provides an opportunity for someone like Kulbach to envision a national poem for Belarus in the Yiddish language. And we can note that even today, even in 2020, Belarus is one of the few countries on earth that recognizes Yiddish, believe it or not, Yiddish as one of its national languages. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Sweden is the only other nation that designates Yiddish with that status. Meaning, paradoxically, uh, but truthfully, the uh, prospects for Yiddish to be represented in a Belarusian national culture are actually institutionally greater today than they are in Israel or in the United States. That's kind of interesting to contemplate. Let's get back now to territory that for me uh, uh, academically is a little bit more familiar and that is the role of uh, Belarus in Eastern European or what we would call Ashkenazic Jewish culture. I'm gonna share my screen for a second. I hope everybody can see what I'm doing here and I hope that what I'm doing makes sense to you. Um, what I've got here is a map of the Pale of Settlement. The Pale of Settlement historically defined, and I know that for some of you this material is familiar, but I'm taking the chance that maybe for not everybody is it familiar and it's useful for us all to have a common terminology to discuss what we're dealing with. The Pale of Settlement refers to, and I hope you can all see my cursor, this strip of land over the course of what we call in historical terms, the long 19th century from 1795 to 1917 that was occupied by the Russian empire that is between real Russia, historical Russia, ethnic Russia, and 
Romania, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Prussia before there was a German empire after the 1870s. This is territory that Russia acquired as part of a tripartite partition of the old Commonwealth of Poland. What happens is that Prussia, Austro-Hungary, and it was called Austria in those days, and Russia get together and they decide that this thing called Poland, it's getting on their nerves. It shouldn't exist anymore. And from the year 1772 until 1795, they gradually claimed more and more of the territory that had been autonomously Polish up to that point. Now, this poses a problem for uh, the Russian Empire. Russia wants to be an empire, but it doesn't want Jewish people to be living in what was historically defined as Russia. So what do they do? Ingeniously, they set up this territory, which was already one of the largest population centers for Jewish people in the history of Jewish civilization from uh, Abraham, our father, until today. Uh, this is set up as the place where the Jews are supposed to live. This is the territory which Russia regulated uh, the Jewish population from. Jews could only cross this border into the real Russia by official government position, uh, official government permission. There's lots of traffic at this side of the border between the Pale of Settlement and Prussia, the Pale of Settlement and uh, Austria. Uh, that means traffic means both commercial traffic, people are doing business at these borders, but also uh, intra-ethnic religious traffic. Jews could go from the Austrian Empire to the Pale of Settlement, to see their rebbies, their Hasidic leaders, and vice versa. So the religious culture, as well as the commercial culture, and inevitably at the same time, the intellectual culture is very, very porous going east to west. But if we see the Pale of Settlement as the Western corridor of the uh, Russian empire, it is much more limited going from west to east. Now, the center of the Pale of Settlement, the northern center of the Pale of Settlement, what my cursor is circling around, if you're able to see it, and I hope that you are, is what we would call today the Belarusian part of the Pale of Settlement. This is the heart of the Pale of Settlement. And that heart, that center, constitutes itself in a very complex formulation of the cultural possibilities that are available to Belarusian Jews. First of all, and this is not a part of uh, Belarusian Jewish culture that we're going to be focusing in this series, there is a whole lot of very important Hebrew language culture taking place in Belarusia, in Raisin. There are a lot of important yeshivas that raise some of the leading rabbis of the 19th century and prior to the 19th century as well, specifically located in what is today Belarus. There is a uh, enormous Yiddish speaking population. One of the features of life in the Pale Settlement in the 19th century, there was a linguistic survey of the Russian Empire. And please keep in mind that when we refer to the Pale of Settlement, we are referring exclusively to a political and geographic uh, formation that refers back to Russian imperial categories. There was a linguistic census in, 19, in 1897 of the Russian Empire. In the Pale of Settlement, Jews stated that their primary language of communication in 1897 was Yiddish. 98% of the Jewish population of the Pale of Settlement spoke Yiddish as of 1897. That's a lot of Yiddish speaking Jews. That's the heart of Yiddish speaking culture. Everything that I study having to do with late 19th and 20th century Yiddish culture comes out of this geographical formulation, whether located in some place like Minsk or a place like Odessa or a place like 
uh, Woj or Warsaw, or its diasporas in places like the United States and Canada, South America, Australia, even uh, 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 brave little Israel. All of these diasporas derive from the Pale of Settlement, which itself is a, uh, uh, a diasporic uh, 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 center for Jewish culture. The Yiddish culture, and I refer in part or maybe primarily to the Yiddish literary culture that grows out of this center, this uh, Belarusian center, draws on Russian literature, Lithuanian literature, Prussian literature, which is to say German literature, Austrian literature, and Polish literature. It is a sextilingual culture. It is a language uh, or it's a literary culture that derives from six languages. And we see vestiges of this specifically in Kohlbach's uh, 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 poetry as we are going to begin to discuss in a few minutes. The origins of modern Yiddish literature really begin, well, we can locate this in a number of different ways. We can talk about, and I'm pointing here to a little south of uh, Belarus, Kamenets Podolska, where the uh, Hasidic movement start, starts and where different Hasidic groups begin publishing sh short stories, fables, sayings of the Rebbe's in Yiddish as well as in Hebrew. We can talk about Odessa as a publishing center for the first Yiddish language modern newspaper that begins publication in 1862. We can talk about Vilna um, up here in what we would now call and what was historically known in Jewish terms as the Lithuanian uh, center, a great place for publishing um, Hebrew books, religious books, and also Yiddish story books. A Belarusian reader would derive uh, their literary materials, their Yiddish uh, uh, materials from all of these centers. Let me talk a little bit about the kind of Yiddish that was spoken in this part of, um, of the Pale of Settlement. And I'm gonna share my screen again, uh, 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 thusly. Um, here's my whiteboard, I'm sharing it. And I'm gonna draw a picture for you with the hopes that some of you are going to recognize what I've drawn today. Believe it or not, this is a geographically meaningful sign. What I've just drawn for you is a map of the Pale of Settlement insofar as it reflects the primary distinctions among Yiddish dialects. Here is what we call Northeastern, Litvish, Lithuanian Yiddish. Here is what we call the Southern dialects of um, Yiddish, Ukrainian, Romanian Yiddish. And here is what we call the Central dialects, Polish Yiddish, Transcarpathian Yiddish, Hungarian Yiddish, and all that good stuff. Belarus, White Russia, Reisen, this is part of Northeastern Yiddish. And one of the most significant cultural means of understanding what Litvish Yiddish signifies, what this Northeastern, what this Northeastern Yiddish dialect signifies can be determined by what my professor, David Roskies, refers to as the, the ichthyolect, the determination of Yiddish dialects via the way in which Jews seasoned their gefilte fish. This is really, really important stuff. If I were giving a final exam in this lecture series, ichthyolect would be one of the terms that everybody needs to know what it refers to. Gefilte fish, I don't have to tell you this, is a very important part of Ashkenazic Jewish culture. And there are two primary ways in which gefilte fish 
can be seasoned with pepper or with sugar. Now, if I say with pepper and you're used to eating your gefilte fish with sugar, you would say, feh, whoever heard of such nonsensical stuff? If I say sugar and you're used to seasoning your gefilte fish with pepper, ugh, inedible. Only somebody as foolish as a speaker of Southeastern Yiddish would think to do that. Why can't you season it like sweet and pepper at the same time? Such a combination never existed. Such gefilte fish was not admitted onto Noah's Ark back in the days of the Great Flood. But pepper in the gefilte fish believe it or not, is an extraordinary and uncanny indication of the presence of the Lithuanian uh, 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 dialect of, Engl uh, of, of Yiddish. Uh, yes, so having defined for you all what Lithuanian culture is, some of the circumstances, some of the characteristics of this culture that Belarus participates in, pepper in the gefilte fish, most important. Um, generally speaking, when one speaks of Belarusian Jewish culture, one is speaking of the upper reaches of where Hasidic Judaism reached in uh, the 19th century, and also the center of where non-Hasidic traditional Judaism, by which we would call technically misnagdish or opposed to Hasidism, misnagdish Jewish culture, or another way of putting it, yeshivish Talmudic based Yiddish culture had its center in Belarus. It is the great crossroads of Pale of Settlement Jewish culture. And Moshe Kulbach is one of the most talented, one of the most representative, one of the most uh, 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 representative yet distinctive and original voices of a Belarusian Yiddish culture. I can think of a few other people uh, who we could also include in this category. The great uh, Yiddish novelist, also Hebrew novelist of the late 19th century, Mendela Moichers Forem, was a Belarusian Jew who was primarily active in what we would call today the Ukrainian parts of Eastern European Pale of Settlement Jewish culture. Kadya Molodovsky, probably the most prolific female writer in Yiddish, and certainly among the very most important female writers in Yiddish, was a near contemporary of Kohlbach's and uh, also comes from Belarus. There are other figures that one could uh, 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 include. One could also include a couple of very important Hebrew language writers who come from the same uh, general area uh, as Molodovsky, as Mendela, as uh, uh, Moshe Kolbach. But Moshe Kolbach himself was born in 1896 in Smorgon in uh, uh, Belarus. He had a very traditional Jewish education the way that essentially all Yiddish language writers did. He studied in Cheder in a traditional elementary school uh, a setting where Yiddish and Hebrew, that where, 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 where Yiddish was taught in order to read Hebrew texts. The language of instruction was Yiddish. The uh, uh, textual material was in Hebrew. He went to a Russian language gymnasium, as did other Yiddish writers in the uh, 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 Pale of Settlement, such as Sholem Alechem, who was from the South, who was from Ukraine. And then he had some very intensive years of study in the Belarusian yeshivas. So we're dealing with somebody with a very unusual and very stimulating and very inspiring mixture of cultural uh, uh, and linguistic uh, 
uh, uh, inspirations. There is the traditional Yiddish language curriculum of the Cheder, which bespeaks a commitment to what we would call traditional values, what we would call Yiddish language folklore, uh, many other uh, 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 cultural signifiers. There is the Russian language culture that certainly inevitably determined a lot of the literary choices that Kolbach is going to make as an emerging writer. And there is the higher learning of the yeshiva that enables Kolbach to have a very rich access to the Hebrew language uh, tradition simultaneous to uh, uh, what is happening in modern Yiddish literature as well as what is happening via Russian in modern U European literature. All of these mixed together. Kolbach, born in 1896, emerges in the immediate aftermath of World War I, when he was a mere lad of 21, 22, 23 years old, emerges as one of the most talented and one of the most capable of Yiddish language poets. And it is as a poet that we're going to primarily focus on uh, uh, Moshe Kulbach in these four sessions. Let me talk a little bit about a couple of Kohlbach's literary antecedents, because these are names that are important. Those of you who study Yiddish literature uh, intensively, these will be familiar names to you. Some of you who are coming to Yiddish literature with less background and less experience need to be aware of these uh, 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 these. Uh, progenitors, if you will, these literary father and uncle figures. I've mentioned Mendel Amoichas Forum, which is actually kind of a pen name. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but these series are dedicated to Kolbach, not Mendel, so I'll gloss over that for a second. The pen name of someone named Sholem Yankov Abramovich. Abramovich is the founder of the Yiddish novel and the Hebrew novel. He's like the Simone de Bolivar of modern Jewish literature. He is the father of more than one literature. But Abramovich is the great Jewish novelist in Eastern Europe of the 19th century. Everybody owes an intellectual debt to him. Much of his fiction is addressed symbolically what we would call in technical terms, mythopoetically, that is the mythology that the author creates himself in order to cast his specific literary creativity against a backdrop of larger cultural uh, and pre-cultural resonances. His mythopoesis, the poetic mythology of his own uh, devising is addressed to his childhood in Belarus, in Raisin. And one of the things that's so distinctive about Abramovich, about Mendela, uh, in contrast with all of his other uh, uh, 19th century peers, is the profound divide in Abramovich's fiction between the internal, insular, indoors world of traditional Jewish culture, the claustrophobia of life in the shtetl, against the vast and rejuvenating panorama of life in nature. Each of Abramovich's protagonists longs to escape the confines of the shtetl in order to enjoy, to take inspiration, to revivify himself. And when we're talking about Abramovich, we're talking almost exclusively of male protagonists. They wish to uh, uh, resuscitate themselves in the cleansing beauty of the natural landscape. Keep this in mind when we get to Kulbach, and we will get to Kulbach today. Another important figure to keep in mind when we discuss Kulbach, and specifically Kulbach as a poet, uh, 
is the Polish Yiddish writer Yud Lamed Peretz. Yud Lamed, these are Yiddish letters, these are Hebrew letters. What we would call in English, we see in print I-L or Y-L Peretz, Yitzhak Leibish Peretz. Another of the giants of 19th century uh, Yiddish literature. There are two or three really profound uh, marks of Peretz's influence on Kulbach. And these marks are not just specific to Kulbach, but for many of the writers of Kulbach's generation coming up immediately after Peretz. Peretz was born in 1852, he dies in 1915. So when Kulbach is coming of age as a literary or a literarily inclined adolescence, Peretz is not only uh, uh, a, a huge presence in Yiddish literature, he's actually still writing at that time. Peretz begins life uh, really as a Hebrew language writer. In the 1880s, all of Peretz's writing is pretty much in Hebrew until the very end of the decade when he begins writing in Yiddish. His first published Yiddish literary work is a long and very ironic ballad poem called Monish. This is for all intents and purposes. And I'm saying this, I'm making a deliberately broad claim because the claim is so important. This is essentially the origins of modern Yiddish poetry. There'd been poetry in Yiddish going back really to the 14th to the 13th century, but in the modern uh, era, Yiddish poetry really only gets its start in 1888, really. We can quibble about this if we wanna be grad students, but the real narrative of modern Yiddish poetry begins with Peretz writing this very sophisticated, very entertaining, very uh, complex, ironic ballad called Monish. And I want those of you who may have, maybe have already read Monish previously, I want you to keep this in mind as we make our slow read through uh, uh, Reisen, because I think that there are a lot of very significant resonances between Kulbach's long poem and Peretz's debut ballad. The genre of the ballad in 19th century literature, a genre that is best exemplified in European literature by figures such as Lord Byron and Heinrich Heine, is really, really significant for our ability to appreciate what Kohlbach is trying to do in his own adaptation of the ballad form as a kind of ironic, uh, imaginary, uh, hypothetical national epic for Belarus. And the third progenitor whom I want to discuss to contextualize um, Kohlbach's poetry is a figure who is not nearly as well known in, in the, in the uh, study of uh, uh, Yiddish literature as uh, Mendela or Peretz uh, are. Not even as well known as Moshe Kohlbach himself is, but he's a significant poet and he's a significant influence on uh, 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 Kohlbach. And he's somebody that my friend and colleague Jordan Finken has written a lot about. Uh, the third figure I want to talk about is named Leib Nidus. I'm going to share my screen again. And I'm going to um, write these names down once more. Where did I go? Okay. Sorry for the inelegant handwriting. Leib Nidus. If I had more time, I would also write down the name of my friend Jordan Finken, who has written extensively about Leibnidus and his uh, criticism is well worth seeking out. Leibnidus is not as famous as Peretz, 
or as famous as Mendela. And again, I'm sorry for my uh, lazy, sloppy, no good handwriting. I'll try to write more elegantly next time. Leibnitz was born in 1890. So just six years before Kohlbach. He died in 1918. So you can see he died uh, very, very young. But in spite of his short life and his brief career, Leibniz is the greatest exponent of what we can call a neo-romantic aesthetic in Yiddish poetry. What does neo-romantic mean? Well, one thing that neo-romantic means is Yiddish literature never really had a romantic period. It wasn't developed enough as a modern literature during the heyday of European romanticism in the early part of the 19th century to participate in that movement fully. So belatedly, uh, Yiddish writers uh, work their way up to uh, a romantic aesthetic only at the very end of the 19th century to a certain extent Peretz is one of the exponents of this neo-romantic uh, aesthetic, but the greatest poetic exponent of it is this young man named Leibniz. And Leibniz's neo-romanticism is the primary influence on Kohlbach's early lyric poetry, which he began publishing in 1918. Really, in the year that Leibniz dies, that's when Kohlbach's career begins. And he is the primary, after Nidus, he is the primary exponent of, uh, of neo-romanticism in Yiddish poetry. Um, what that means for Nidus is, uh, so we have a, a, a comment in uh, uh, chat from uh, our comrade Shana saying that uh, Jordan Finken has written a book called Exile is Home, the Cosmopolitan Poetics of Leibnitz. I recommend this book highly. Uh, what this means, what Kohlbach derives from Nidus, Nidus's neo-romanticism is an effort at imagining himself as a kind of Lord Byron, a kind of Byronic figure of heroism, aristocracy, noblesse oblige, uh, intimacy with the landscape. These are what we, we could call poetic tropes. These are uh, efforts at self-dramatization that Kohlbach adapts from Nidus. And we might add, Nidus dying young is the ultimate Lord Byron imitation. It wasn't something that he necessarily had control over. I think he actually died of the uh, international flu epidemic. But nonetheless, you couldn't hope for a more Byronic uh, exit than to die young. And Nidus uh, succeeded in that. Kohlbach's own early death was uh, not quite so Byronic, not quite so uh, 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 picture perfect. I'll get to that in a second. And we'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps by the uh, end of uh, our session. Uh, Yiddishkeit in Los Angeles is correcting me. Leibniz died of diphtheria. Let me just editorialize here. Whether you die of diphtheria or of the international, of the, of the Spanish flu, it's a terrible way to die. Um, uh, and uh, all of us should be immunized against all uh, uh, viruses that are out there. Um, I, I, and Leibniz reminds us of that uh, 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 acutely. Kohlbach uh, takes over from Nidus the legacy of neo-romantic poetry. After World War I, as we can all understand, however little we understand of world history after World War I, we all know, recognize, and understand that life in Eastern Europe was particularly precarious, politically, economically, and philosophically for Jews in Eastern Europe after World War I. So like many uh, 
significant writers, Kohlbach goes to Berlin in 1920. And this is the subject of my own research. Uh, Simon was kind enough to uh, refer to it in, in his introduction to me. Uh, the, a forthcoming book that I've just finished writing is dedicated to describing the literary culture that writers like Kohlbach, Yiddish writers uh, from Eastern Europe, created very briefly during the 1920s in Berlin. Reisen, the poem that we're going to be discussing today and in the subsequent three uh, sessions of our series, uh, was written actually in Berlin. And the strangeness of this fact the um, indelible oddness of writing about the Belarusian countryside from Berlin is a significant factor for me in the way that I understand this poem, as I hope to explain to you over the uh, remaining sessions that we have together. I hope that this will become the strangeness of this poem, I hope, is something that will become clearer as we actually embark upon reading it, as I hope we will do in a very few short minutes. One of the things that Kohlbach encounters in Berlin that transforms his writing and makes him ultimately a more enduring and complicated and multifaceted writer than his early inspiration Leibnidus was, is an encounter both philosophically and aesthetically with what we understand as literary modernism. What is literary modernism? Well, it's a word that people like me uh, invented about 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, so that we could ensure that we would have work as university professors. But what we mean when we talk about literary modernism, and it's a word that primarily uh, exists and has been developed in what we would call the English Language Academy. Um, French literary critics, German literary critics, Polish literary critics don't really talk about modernism the way that we Americans, we English language literary critics do. Nonetheless, I think it's a useful concept because it's a means of understanding how a variety of avant-garde aesthetic strategies throughout the world uh, function to offer a coherent aesthetic statement out of very diverse cultures, languages, and uh, artistic ideologies. Modernism, in my understanding of the term, is an effort, an aesthetic effort at critiquing modernity itself via the means of modernization. Now, I've just given you a lot of M's. Modernity, modernization, modernism. I'll try to explain over the next four sessions how this works and in what ways, in spite of a neo-romantic aesthetic veneer or surface, we can understand Kohlbach's poetics as exemplifying literary modernism. And I use all these technical terms not because I want you to be habituated to understanding a lot of technical terms, but rather because I'm using these terms, I hope, and I hope that over the course of our conversations, you will come to agree that these terms help us to understand Kohlbach in a larger historical and cultural context. If I say modernism, if I say neo-romanticism, if I say impassioned bagelhood, none of these terms have any meaning just as an end of, of themselves. We've actually done nothing to understand Kohlbach or the uh, epic poem Reisen merely by calling it modernist or merely by calling it neo-romantic or merely by calling it a day. We understand it via these terms when these terms connect us to a larger cultural dialogue. And that's why I'm discussing how important it was for Kohlbach to encounter uh, uh, the aesthetics of modernism while he's in Berlin. He comes to Berlin partly for a number of reasons. One reason that he comes to Berlin is because 
can't stay in Eastern Europe anymore. It's not safe. It's not stable. You can't feed yourself. You can't work as a writer. You can't do much of anything as a Jewish person in Eastern Europe in that period. Another reason why is because Berlin in 1920 is really, really cheap. This is the era when, you know, keep in mind, you know, it costs a million German marks to buy a loaf of bread in the morning, and it costs three million German marks to buy that same loaf of bread in the evening. It's the era of hyperinflation of the German mark. It's an era that lasts from about 1919 until about 1924. During that time, if I show up with one Russian ruble, or even better, one American dollar, I'm a millionaire and I can do things. I can support myself. I can support my writing. I can support my publishing relatively comfortably in Berlin in a way that I cannot in Warsaw, in a way that I can't yet in what's going to become by 1921 the Soviet Union, and in which I can't really do in America either for a variety of, 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 of cultural, political, and institutional reasons. So Berlin is a really nice place for Eastern European refugees to settle upon, to, uh, 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 to live in during that era. That's another reason that brought him to Berlin. But a third reason that brought Moshe Kulbach to Berlin specifically is he had hopes of studying in Berlin. He had hopes of studying at the university. He wanted to read German literature and philosophy. Now, it seems from what we know biographically, his German wasn't good enough or he was too much of a refugee, his political circumstance was too precarious, or he didn't have the requisite uh, qualifications that enabled him to actually enroll in the university. But he spends his time in Berlin from 1920 till about 1923, 24, again, when uh, currency reform makes Berlin a much more expensive place for foreign refugees to live. Um, that's when Kulbach, like many other Eastern European Jews, uh, uh, depart. But he spends that time very intensively reading German philosophy, working in Yiddish theater, and developing a, an entirely new aesthetic for his writing. It is an aesthetic that is open to trends such as expressionism, and uh, what we would call uh, the new objectivity or the neue Sachlichkeit that characterizes um, German language, visual culture, film, and literature. It enables Kohlbach to publish his Yiddish language writing. He always only writes exclusively in Yiddish. It enables him to publish that Yiddish language uh, uh, writing in uh, uh, American journals. It puts him in dialogue with Yiddish poets working in New York City, which at that time was the center of avant-garde experimentation for Yiddish poetry. And it also, for a variety of what we could say psychological and aesthetic reasons, encourages him to begin writing not just lyric poetry, but also prose. And Kohlbach is not unique, but he is distinctive in so far as his prose is actually more experimental than his poetry is. Like I said, he's not unique, but he is unusual in that regard. The other Yiddish language writer who I think best exemplifies that urge toward experimentation in prose and cultivation of traditional forms in poetry is Avram Sutzkever, another, uh, another Lanzmann, a fellow Jewish Litvak like uh, uh, Kohlbach, and certainly someone who was very aware of Kohlbach's poetry and prose in his own writing. 1924. First of all, it's in Berlin, as I've said before, that Kohlbach uh, publishes uh, Reisen. He publishes it in New York. Uh, 
So think about the triangulated cultural geography that Reisen itself, that the epic poem itself uh, exemplifies. A poem about Eastern Europe written in Berlin, published in New York City. This is characteristic of the cultural, geographical, and uh, political complexity of Yiddish literature in Weimar Berlin. This is something that I wanted to write a book about and have done. In 1924, Kohlbach leaves, uh, uh, um, leaves Berlin, returns to Eastern Europe. He uh, originally goes to Vilna, which by that point was part of Poland, and he becomes a hugely charismatic figure in the Vilna Yiddish scene. He becomes an early mentor to a group of writers who become known as Jung Vilna, the young Vilnius, of which Avram Sutzkeber, whom I just referred to, was an important, if somewhat peripheral, member. Um, he doesn't stay in, in, in Vilna. He uh, returns to Minsk, which is in the Soviet Union very definitely, uh, around 1929. Now, there's a lot more to say about Kohlbach's career in the 1920s and in the 1930s, and I do want to get to that before our series of talks is over. We will return to the second half of Kohlbach's very short and ultimately tragic career, but there are two things that I really want to do now uh, uh, while we're all together on our first session. First of all, I'd like to read a little bit of the poetry with you. And I'd also like to open it up for discussion. So I think that what we're going to do now is um, read the first poem or two in Yiddish and then in uh, English translation, it has been very ably translated, part of an initiative of the Yiddishkeit Los Angeles uh, 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 Institution program. We're very grateful for that translation and we're gonna be relying on it for this discussion. Um, let's try to read the first poem or two in this 12 poem cycle. And then I'd like to open it up to discussion. And I want to leave at least 15 minutes of discussion um, hopefully, uh, maybe a little bit more if people want to stick around. I'm flexible. I'm under quarantine, so I got nothing but time, folks. But at least to uh, give 15 minutes of discussion, and we'll pick up there again next uh, Wednesday. So I'm going to share my screen again, if I may. Here we have the beginning of the poem Reisen in its Yiddish uh, version. We're going to revert in a few minutes to uh, the English language translation to discuss what we've just read. But if you'll allow me, please, I'd like to read for you the uh, first section of uh, Kohlbach's poem. This is Reisen, Aleph, Reisen. Oh, der Zeder. Von Kobelnik is a Yida Poshiter, a poyer mit a pelts, on mit a hack, on mit a fared. On meine Sachsen Vetters, on mein Tate, jeden Proste, jeden, wie die Sticker erd. Treiben Plitten, auf die Teichen, schleppen Kletzer von die Wälder, on dem ganzen Tag gehore wird. Wie Chlopis. Erst mein Wetschere vernacht zusammen von ein Schüssel. Und man fällt nieder in die sachsen Betten wie die Snoppes. Der Seide, oh, der Seide, klettert kaum er ruffet auf den Oven. Er ist der Altitschker beim Tisch an Schlafen schon geworden. Nur die Fies Se wesen, fieren se allein im ob zum Oven, dem Seidens gute Fies, was dienen ihm von kame Jahren. I'm going to change now to uh, uh, the English language translation, which I hope everybody can see. Ah, my grandpa in Kobilnik is a simple sort of fellow, a farmer with a horse and with an axe and with a sheepskin as common as the clay 
are all my 16 uncles and my father hauling logs out of the forest, driving rafts upon the river. They toil the live long day like ordinary peasants, then eat their supper of an evening gathered round a single platter and fall into their 16 beds like sheaves of grain together. Grandpa, ah, my grandfather, he can hardly climb the oven half asleep at supper. His poor old eyes kept closing, and yet his feet have somehow found their way, their own way to the oven. My grandpa's loyal feet, which served him for so many years. This is the first section of a 12-part poem that Kolbach has written. The translation by Leonard Wolf, one of the great translators of Yiddish literature into English. Also, very significantly, the translator of the English language book, Winnie the Pooh, into Yiddish. Leonard Wolf only died about a year ago or so at a very advanced age, but he was a treasure. And uh, all of his translations are worth reading, both the Winnie the Pooh into Yiddish, as well as his many valuable translations from Yiddish into English, this one uh, uh, preeminently. <clears throat> so there's a lot happening in this first section. And as, as has been advertised, this is going to be a slow read. We're going to make a real cholent out of this epic poem. We're going to take our time through each of the 12 sections over the next uh, uh, three, and, three and one quarter uh, sessions remaining uh, uh, of our series. White Russia. Well, for starters, what surprises me about an epic called White Russia or Belarus or Reisen is, first of all, that it's written in Yiddish. That's kind of counterintuitive. And that it is about Jews, a family of Jews. I'll preface this remark by saying, Kolbach has an unusual interest in not the shtetl community, which he begins to write about at a moment when the shtetl as a cultural institution for Ashkenazic or Eastern European Jewry is in the rapid process of disintegrating not necessarily or exclusively about the individual as we come to expect of um, modern uh, 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 literature generally. His primary interest or one of the ways that makes Kulbach a distinctive writer is his interest in creating uh, extended family narratives. And our friend Hannah Ganshor has just participated in the, in, the, in the chat to recall Kohlbach's greatest literary achievement. And for those of you who joined me in my lecture series in Berlin a year ago, the primary reason why Kohlbach got shot, spoiler alert, uh, is his two-volume novel called Zelman Yanner. Zelman Yanner is about the sons of Zelman, the sons of Zalman, the sons of Schleiman, the sons of Solomon. It's about a, an extended family that functions as a tribe between uh, the shtetl and nature, between the Pale of Settlement and the new Soviet Union. Kolbach is fascinated by these um, extended families that function as a challenge to the notion of um, a unitary small town Jewish culture, which was definitive of uh, uh, 19th century Jewish literature, and also pose a challenge as a kind of unassimilable collective unit situated against what can be called the new Soviet man of Soviet aesthetics. And Reisen is one of the great examples of Kulbach's focus on what I'm calling, not uh, capriciously, I hope, 
what I'm referring to as the Jewish tribe. My grandpa in Kobilnik is a simple sort of fellow. Well, grandpas, that's very conventional Yiddish literature. Kobilnik, uh, Belarusian village, that's and not a shtetl, that's distinctive. A grandpa with 16 uncles and my father, that's almost mythological. That's almost supernatural. Who has such large families outside of maybe Borough Park or Mea Sharim today? This would be unusual in Kulbach's era as well. 16 uncles and my father, that's the unit to which this poem is dedicated. Specific individuals emerge from time to time over the course of the 12 poems. But it's the collective as a whole that is the genuine protagonist of this, uh, of this poem. And that's unusual. That's, that one only finds, I would contend, in Kulbach's writing. What else is unusual about this? Well, these are village Jews. These are not shtetl Jews. And speaking in English, we have a tendency to conflate village, small town. What do you want from me? Uh, not so many people, not so much modernity. What's the difference? The difference in Yiddish cultural geography, in Yiddish spatial politics, is not just important, it's fundamental. A village is a place defined both by the state and by a still pervasively rabbinical culture as a place without an organized Jewish community. A shtetl is the headquarters of an organized Jewish community. One of the cultural features in Jewish terms that defines a shtetl is the presence of a kosher butcher, of a ritual bath, of a house of study, of a rabbi, of an infrastructure for Jewish learning through which Jewish masculinity is administered and regulated and uh, made legible one to the other. All of that is lacking in uh, the village. And what is significant to me for Kulbach, what is significant to me about this poem is, paradoxically, in one family, the villagers of Reisen have enough Jews to function as a Jewish community. And yet they don't. They don't function the way that Jews function in the shtetl. And what we can say about this in terms of the relationship of the poem to Kulbach's own autobiography, there are autobiographical elements to this poem. He was from white Russia. He did know the Jewish farming communities in white Russia quite well. His family does derive from this odd mixture of Jewish and peasant, Jewish peasantry stock. But what's missing from this, were we to read this as an autobiography, is the simple fact that Kohlbach's origins are not in the villages, they are in the shtetl. And that Kohlbach, in spite of his tremendous artistic affinity with nature, is himself a product of a sophisticated Russian language education and a, a, a sophisticated Hebrew language uh, uh, education, neither of which is on display in this poem. As I've said uh, 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 in my writing about this poem, it's as if it's reminiscent of an old Woody Allen joke where uh, Woody Allen is talking about fearing for his life and his life begins to flash in front of his eyes. And he remembers his childhood growing up in Kansas and 
fishing for catfish and seeing his cousin Mary Lou in her gingham dress. And all of a sudden, at this moment of death, it hits him. He's uh, remembering the wrong life. Kohlbach is imagining a life that doesn't correspond to the details of his own upbringing, his own family, his own autobiographical uh, experience. It is a life not understood in autobiographical terms, but understood in mythological terms. And the mythological connection is simultaneously to a Jewish past and a Belarusian past. So we're going to transition now from uh, uh, my general remarks. This is all by way of getting us started. We'll pick up here next time to a question and answer session. And I've received a question for someone who just became aware of Kohlbach. What would the distinguished speaker, recommend as Kohlbach's work to start from? Well, obviously the best place to start is with our discussions of Reisen here, but there is an excellent translation of Kohlbach's great two volume novel, Zelman Yanner, available in English. It was uh, translated by my friend, Sasha Senderovich. It was published about four or five years ago. It's available in paperback in English, very inexpensively. It's both volumes in one English language volume. That is the definitive Kohlbach literary experience. It is the summation of all of his uh, aesthetic gestures. Uh, and it is um, the great testimony, not just to his artistic creativity, but also, unfortunately, to his martyrdom under the Soviet regime, a topic that we will inevitably address later in our um, later in our discussions. Isabel Rosenbaumus writes, so striking that this first inter this first part immediately evokes the universe of Zelman Yanner that Kohlbach had not yet written. I think that that's an excellent point. And this is something that occurred to me as well when I was first beginning to research and first beginning to read Kohlbach quite uh, uh, comprehensively. The elements of the, uh, uh, of the Zelmanyaner formula, if you will, are already available in poetry before he begins writing the novel. And he writes the novel, it's fundamental to understand, against a backdrop of Soviet Belarus that he had not yet experienced firsthand when he's writing this poem in Berlin. Let me uh, elaborate on that very uh, 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 briefly, schematically, and with apologies, somewhat cryptically. There is a poem that Kohlbach has written in 1919, right before he relocates to um, uh, uh, Berlin, called Lomidvolv, the 36, the 36 legendary uh, righteous Jews who keep the world uh, 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 existing, that, that preserve the world against God's most uh, uh, unforgiving judgment. This poem is in certain respects similar to Reisen, but it is also for many technical and thematic reasons quite distinct from Reisen. And it anticipates Kohlbach's first prose work, which is called Mashiach ben Ephraim, the Josephian Messiah, if you will. Uh, the efforts of a group of Belarusian Jews to discover the Messiah in one of their own countrymen. It's a catastrophic tragic comedy. It's one of the most interesting and distinctive and unclassifiable works of Yiddish literature. Lam Edvolv, the poem, anticipates Mashiach ben Ephraim, the prose work, as Reisen, the poem, anticipates Zelman Yanner, the novel. Uh, Kohlbach, in many ways, is a very schematic writer, and his poetic uh, 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 experiments anticipate his subsequent prose writing. Simon, our host, our dear leader, asks, is there a symbolic numerical meaning of Reisen consisting of 12 poems? On the one hand, one might expect that there would be 18 poems. First of all, because there are 18 figures that are in the tribe. There's the grandpa, the uh, 16 uncles, and the father figure. 18 poems would signify life. 
And yet there are 12 poems. I think most immediately what uh, resonates for us as readers of Yiddish literature is 12 poems equals 12 tribes. That there is supposed to be a parallel somehow with Jacob the patriarch, the biblical patriarch, about whom we are about to be introduced in this week, this Shabbos's Torah reading. Jacob is the patriarch of all Israel, as my grandpa is the patriarch of this tribe of yellow Russian Jews. Um, my grandpa is another version of Jacob. My grandpa is therefore another, uh, 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 another iteration, another, if you will, uh, 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 Gilgal, another incarnation of Jacob. My grandpa is Israel, says uh, uh, Shalom Leaf. Falling sheaves of wheat are also reminiscent of Jacob's clan. First of all, Shalom, I would really invite you to unmute yourself and maybe elaborate a little bit on that. But second, absolutely right. We need to be very, very aware as we read these poems in the next three sessions of the immense and continuous, um, the immense and continuous biblical resonances that Kulbach uh, 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 smuggles into this poem. Um, so let me read. So uh, Anton wants to suggest um, that uh, uh, 12, 12 months, 12, uh, 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 12 uh, poems. I think that that's a very good resonance also because 12 months would suggest for us an organic uh, uh, cyclical continuity that is both advertised in this poem and subverted by the poem's end. That this poem is very much about an organic uh, connection of Jews to the land and an organic connection of generations one to the other. And yet it is also definitively about the poet's own um, break with this organic continuity. It is an elegy for a lost organicism. Uh, Anna Gershevich is saying, the introduction to the English translation provides much useful context. Um, is this the, the English language introduction to uh, Reisen in our website, or is it the English language translation to um, uh, Zelman Yanner, the, the novel? I'm sorry, Shalom. Let me see if I can unmute you. I have to find you. Okay. Shalom, I've unmuted you. Yes, hello, Shalom, please speak. Hi. So, so Joseph, the son of Jacob, has a dream in which, um, well, in which uh, sheaves of wheat are bowing down before him. And the sheaves are his brothers. And in the, in the biblical context, of course, this anticipates his uh, ascendancy in Egypt and the fact that the brothers will come to him as supplicants. But it's just interesting in the first section here that they fall into their beds like sheaves of wheat. I think you're absolutely right. And part of what's distinctive about this, if we consider the biblical text, the sheaves of wheat dream is Joseph's first dream. And dreaming is fundamental to uh, Joseph's uh, uh, entire narrative arc, if you will. There's a second dream where there are uh, stars and the moon uh, bowing before him, which Jacob interprets to be not just the, the sons, not just jo Joseph's brothers, but also his parents are bowing down before him. And Jacob is like, eh, that's a little too much, Joseph. You, you might want to uh, 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 back off a little bit. Um, it's as sheaves of wheat that provides both the, uh, 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 um, the connection of the brothers one to another and that distinguishes the organic connection, the connection to nature as opposed to the connection to the cosmos that's suggested by Joseph's other dream, which is to say, Shalom, 
you're exactly right. This is this is this is exactly to the point that Kolbach is choosing his biblical references to, uh, very judiciously. Uh, Simabiri says, 12 tribes of Israel. That's exactly right. The 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 sons of Jacob. It's the same unit. Simon is asking, um, Reisen today is not a very common toponym even for Jews. Was it more common in 1922? Did it sound archaic to Kohlbach's contemporaries? The answer is, as Simon anticipates, it was not common in 1922 either. It is a very old-fashioned Yiddish name for Belarus. It is not the way that Belarus is referred to in journalistic accounts. It is not the way that Jews colloquially referred to Belarus in uh, uh, in in uh, the 1920s. Kohlbach is deliberately investing in his poem an archaic name that both distinguishes between the historical and the contemporary uh, 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 Belarus and allows this poem to imagine a mythological Belarus for the purposes of the poem. Um, just reading through the uh, 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 comments. Uh, Simba Berry asks very, very uh, 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 pointedly, where would you place the poem Diesner Child Harold in this landscape of poetry as he wrote it in Berlin? Well, actually, the reality is that um, uh, Kohlbach did not write Diesner Child Harold in Berlin. He actually wrote it in Minsk. He wrote it about his experience in Berlin, but it is a repudiation of that uh, uh, experience. Berlin was a terrible place. I'm so glad I'm back in the Soviet Union where Jews can live correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he wrote it uh, 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 a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, later than his Berlin period. Uh, first of all, Diesner Child Harold, it's referring back to the Lord Byron poem, Child Harold, which is to say that the uh, romantic and satirical ballad that is so fundamental to 19th century literature is still fundamental to the way that Kohlbach conceives of poetry and the way that he uses poetry to dramatize his own life story. So it is similar to Reisen, but it also uh, uh, represents a later stage in his artistic development, a later chapter in his spiritual autobiography and a later poetic rethinking of the ballad form. So um, let me make sure that I get to everybody. Um, Yiddishkeit Los Angeles reminds us, regarding the name Reisen and its history, there's a very good article on the subject by Vladimir Levin and uh, Darius Stalunas, Life in the Jewish Mental Maps in Spatial Concepts of Lithuania in the Long 19th Century. This is a very, very valuable reference. And spoiler alert, it's one that I intend to look up when our session is over today. Um, Anton uh, reminds us of some other Yiddish place names. Chalem, Yehopetz. Uh, Fagel also says, is Reisen also the same as the dative verb to hurt, to ache? In fact, Reisen is a homonym for the verb Reisen to rip, to tear asunder. Um, can 12 have some Kabbalistic meaning for Kohlbach in this case? The answer is yes, it could. Um, but it also has more immediate associations as, as have already been uh, 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 addressed to the 12 tribes, to the 12 months. To get back though to um, Anton's comment, Helm and Yechopitz, these are folkloric names. Yechopitz in particular is Sholem Alechem's comic name for Kiev, inspired partly by the fact that Kiev was a city for which Jews had to have official government uh, permission to reside in up until uh, uh, World War I. Uh, the joke, the reason why the characters in uh, uh, Sholem Alechem's fiction refer to Kiev as Yechopitz, 
is because they're 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 in Yehopet, so they're traveling to Kiev without official permission. So they don't say I'm going to Kiev, which could get them in trouble. I'm going to Yehopet, which everybody knows. The sequel to this, though, is as many of you know, Russian Jews even today continue to refer to Kiev as Yehopet. When we get to place names in Reisen, they refer not to legendary names and not to ironic folklore names. They refer to the actual spaces uh, in a symbolic Belarusian geography. These are place names with great resonance for Belarusian history, not so much resonance for Jewish uh, Litvish history. And this is part of the ways that Kohlbach imagines this epic as a national epic. Now, we have reached uh, the end of our official time. I actually have a little time to chat if people want to continue the chatting session. But in terms of our own readings, we are going to pick up here uh, this time next week. By this time next week, I don't mean um, uh, uh, 9.30 p.m. Moscow time. I mean, back again at 8 p.m. Moscow time next Wednesday, we're going to start over again reading the poem. And I hope that all of you will join us again for this series. Um, I've really enjoyed this and I wanna continue enjoying this with all of you. Uh, thank you all. Those of you who wanna continue chatting, um, I'm flexible. Uh, those of you who want to go about the rest of your uh, evening, I hope we'll see all of each other again this time next, uh, 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 next uh, Wednesday.